Hey everybody, welcome back to, well, day four. Today I wanted to talk a lot about some quick start activities that you can do to start homeschooling tomorrow if you have a child who's not reading yet. Now, what I'm about to say comes from an English teacher, so take it in that tone. If your child isn't reading yet, that is the most important activity that you have to push with your children. Yes, math is important, science is important, social studies, that's all important, but it's not as important as the ability to read. So if you're planning on starting homeschool tomorrow with your children and you want to work with a child who can't read yet, that's where your focus needs to be here at the beginning. Yes, you can build in all of the other curriculum, all of the other options as we go along, but start with reading. So today I'm gonna to give you some quick and easy activities some recommended television shows, a bunch of different things to help with that. Now I know that my video is gonna be a little bit long because it's gonna go through a lot of different things and talk about a lot of different things. So if you look down in the description of the video at the bottom, you will have a timestamp for each of the activities and each of the discussions I have. So you can fast forward or rewind or look just for the tool that you want. So the quick start guide for grades pre-K three through grade two. Let me clarify what I mean by pre-K three through grade two. As soon as your child is capable of speaking, they are capable of starting to do activities that will help them learn to read. Anything that helps them learn language at the age of three is a step towards helping them read but you can also teach them letter recognition and simple word recognition and things like that as well. Grade two is a tricky grade because it tends to be a transition grade. Some children in grade two are already reading magnificently. Others can read out loud very well, but they struggle reading silently. And then others, they get to grade two and they really can't read at all. So I title this pre-K through grade two, but it's really mostly for kids who are not reading independently yet. In the video, I'm going to go through several activities. And again, you can look down at the bottom and see the timestamp for each of these activities to help you find exactly what you're looking for if you want to listen to just a part of the video again. So the first one I want to talk about is coloring and tracing. And yes, that is an activity that leads to reading. And as we go through the video, you'll see how it does and why it does. Reading with your child, that definitely impacts a child's reading ability. Parents who read with their children, the literacy rate for those children is 10 times higher than for a child who is, well, who's not reading with their parents. And we'll look more at the literacy rating next time on Monday when I do my literacy video. Then we're gonna talk about two of the major reading philosophies people have. Now there are a lot of different curriculums, a lot of different options out there, but they either follow one philosophy or the other. The first philosophy, I call it the tortoise philosophy, and we'll talk about this more later, and that's phonics. And the second philosophy is the hair philosophy, it's sight words. For those of you who may or may not know the reference, the tortoise and the hare is referencing a fable about a tortoise and a hare who race. And the tortoise is very slow and the hare is very, very fast, the rabbit. The rabbit being so fast, he gets to a point and he decides he's gonna stop and take a nap. And the tortoise being slow and steady keeps plodding on to the end until he beats the hare in the race. And that's kind of the truth of phonics and sight words. Um, simple reading books for children to practice reading. We're gonna talk about the benefits of children reading aloud to you or to each other if you have siblings and some suggested books for various levels. And then finally, because when you are homeschooling a child this young, you have other things you have to do such as feed them and clean the rooms and do the laundry. I have 10 suggested television shows to help your child grow when you need them to be occupied and still and safe while you do the things around the house that have to be done. 
And there's research behind these as well as personal experience, which I'll get into with the 10 suggested shows. So stay tuned, we're gonna see that. Let's get started. <clears throat> coloring and tracing. Coloring and tracing is actually a really useful activity for your child because it teaches them fine motor skills. It teaches them boundaries. It teaches them control. It's also really good for the brain to do things that are creative. So for supplies, for coloring and tracing, you obviously need either a coloring book or a tracing book. Often you can find a coloring or tracing book that is uh, connected, so it does both. And you need crayons, markers, or colored pencils. Be aware each of these items have benefits and drawbacks. When you're dealing with children this young, yes, they're going to draw on things they shouldn't. That could be anything from drawing on the wall or like my nephew who took a Sharpie to his mother's PhD diploma. So they will draw on things. So you want to be careful what you pick. Colored pencils are great because they don't really draw on things well, except for paper. But they're also sharp and you have to sharpen them. Markers are really good, especially if you get the washable ones because they color so easily. Crayons are also good because they color easily and they're also smaller. So they force your children to hold them more correctly and it tends to be better for the fine motor skills. Suggested age is, I say two to eight, but as soon as they can hold a crayon or a marker and they don't put it in their mouth till they no longer want to color, it tends to be a good activity for them. Some of the benefits, it teaches fine motor skills and control. It is also a great activity to, well, take up time when you need time. Parental guidance levels. So this is dependent on the child's needs, but is mostly without direct parent guidance. Yes, it is great to sit with them and help them stay on the lines, but if you have to walk away, you can. And it is very flexible. It's highly flexible. You can color, you can trace, you can draw, you can do characters from a cartoon, or you can mess around with letters either way but it is very flexible content. Reading with your child. Again, like I said earlier, reading with your child is highly beneficial because it improves their desire to read. It also teaches them fluency, which is a key word for English teachers. It teaches them to be comfortable reading. It teaches them that reading is not just something done for school. So uh, supplies needed, you need books with colorful pictures. Again, we're talking about children very young up through about second grade. So colorful pictures, easy to read, easy to follow books are great for this. Um, as long as your child lives with you, I recommend reading with them. That could be reading aloud, cuddled up next to each other on the couch, or it could be silently reading in the same room with the TV off for 15 minutes in the evening with your teenager. Some of the benefits, it teaches your child the benefit of reading and how to recognize individual words. This is for younger ones, sentences and other nuances of reading. So if you are reading to a very young child, it's useful to point to the word as you say it. And parental guidance level, this is very high. This is a completely hands-on activity. It's great, it's super useful, but you do have to be there 100%. The flexibility, very flexible, you choose the content. For those younger kids who you are introducing to reading, this is a great way to work in the history or to work in science. You could read a book on dinosaurs or you could read a book on plants or you could read a book on George Washington. All right, let's take a look at the next one. Okay, so the tortoise and the hare reading philosophies, like I said again, there are two kinds of reading philosophies that tend to guide both teachers and parents. 
I've seen this in the homeschool community and in the public school community. The first one is the tortoise method, the phonics, learning sounds. The good things or the useful thing about doing this method is it prepares your children to read a word in any context. They, if they see a word they don't recognize, they have the reasonable tools to try and figure out what that word might be. Yes, there are exceptions such as, well, macabre or hors d'oeuvres, which are strange words, but most words fit into the phonics rules. Cons, it takes a long time to master. Phonics is a lot of work for the child and it takes them a long time to be able to read. Um, here's the hair. These are sight words. They are great ways to learn the basics. So the pros for learning sight words is it quickly allows your children to master the basic reading words. So you see a lot of progress very fast. The cons, it doesn't provide the necessary tools for complete mastery of reading. If you are doing just sight words, then for a long time, the only words your child can read are sight words. All right. Talking about phonics, so let's go a little bit more into this. For phonics, some of the supplies you'll need are flashcards. These can be handmade or they can be bought. There are a lot of options online if you're gonna buy the flashcards. I have some recommendations in just a minute that I'll show you. Make sure you do the research into the flashcards before you actually buy them because some of the flashcard sets are more of a sight word thing, such as teaching OP as being the sound op which doesn't work when you have words like hope or nope. Suggested age. I would start phonics with children as young as three. Very simple, A says ah, B says b, C says k. Very simple phonics you start very early. The sooner you start, the sooner they will master them completely. The benefit is it teaches children to recognize sounds and use those sounds to build words. And parental guidance level, for the most part, this tends to be very high unless you get a digital program. There are digital programs that will do the flashcards for you, and those are not quite as parental guidance level. It's, it's a lower parental guidance level. You still have to be paying attention, though. The flexibility, the phonics are very rigid. Phonics, you have to follow the sounds, you have to teach them the rules, you have to do, follow it in a logical pattern. It's very rigid. So let me show you what I mean by flashcards. On one side, you have the letter. On the other side, you have the sound. Now, I, I picked R because I love how this particular um, this particular set of flashcards defines the sound. A lot of my students even say that R sounds like er. It's not er, it's r. Rat. We don't say er at, we say rat, right? And so it gives you very specific directions about mouth shape, which if you have a child who has a little bit of a, a, little bit of a lisp, this helps with that. So I really like the teacher instruction as well as the student one. That particular flashcard comes from a set that is tied to writing mode reading. This is the only curriculum plug I'm going to make right here, but I'm going to make it because this is how I learned to read. And I can tell you as an adult in the English profession that I know more about the makeup of the English language than any English teacher I have talked about it with to date. Does that mean I know more than everybody? Absolutely no. But I do know quite a bit and I can explain things to my students that have other teachers scratching their head. And so I highly recommend Writing Road to Reading. They have 60 plus flashcards. They had about 70 when I was a kid, I think. And I think they may have more now. 
with all of the sounds in the English language ordered from most used to least used. So you can start with the most common sounds and then go to the less common sounds. They have explanations of all the strange practices in English, such as all of the reasons for a silent E. Did you know there are five? It has clear directions on how to teach the reading and writing, but it requires a lot of reading before full implementation. But the flashcards you can start from day one. The clear directions are very clear. They give you everything you could possibly want to know. And whenever somebody does that, it does give you a lot of stuff you need to read. But I do highly recommend it because the effects for me as a student have been lifelong and useful. Okay, so now we're gonna get to the hair, sight words. Supplies, you need the list, I say of the 100 most common words in, in English, if you are going flat out sight words, they do a thousand. You start with 100 and then once those 100 are down, you add the next 100 in and you do it until the child knows the first thousand words just by seeing them. Um, suggested age, you start three to four, usually closer to four once they're able to actually say the words. It depends on how articulate your child is. Benefit, it provides fast success at basic reading levels. Parental guidance, again, very high because it is flashcards. And the flexibility is rigid. You do wanna start with those first 100 words. You do them until the child knows every single word on that list, and then you add in the next, and you do it that way. It is very rigid. These are the first 100 words. So you would put each one of these on a little three by five card and flash it at your child. At first you would tell them what the word is and your goal would be to get them to say the word. If you're gonna do it, you wanna mix the words up so that they don't memorize the order. They don't know that very is the next word because the previous word was used. Now, my personal recommendation between phonics and sight words is if you are wanting them to pick up reading fast, say you have a six-year-old who would be entering first grade and you want them to pick up reading fast, I would start with both. I would start with the hundred words, sight words, and help them memorize those, and at the same time, teach them the phonics, because that's gonna give them confidence from the fast and long-lasting foundational from the slow. Okay, simple reading practice. Give this a sec. Simple reading practice, something your child needs to do. And this is not you reading to your child like I said earlier. This is your child reading to you. So once they have the basic sounds and once they have the basic words, you get them very simple books and you have them read to you because it builds confidence. And when they struggle with a word, for instance, this word at right here, let's say they were looking at it and they were struggling with it, you don't give them the word. You help them sound it out. What sound does A make? A makes an ah sound. What sound does T make? T, ah, t, ah, t, until they get it. So you guide them through the words. You do not have to do a whole book in one sitting. That can be very frustrating, I will be honest. I've read with toddlers and young children before. You can do just two pages, one or two pages. Just have them do it a little bit at a time until they get more comfortable. The more they do it, the more comfortable they will get. The more comfortable they are, the more confidence they have. The more confidence they have, the better they do it. Uh, suggested age. I recommend to start doing this as soon as your child can start recognizing basic words. As soon as they start seeing words and being able to read just the basic two or three letter words, then start having them do this. Um, it builds confidence and it gives practice. Again, it is a very high parental guidance level. And the flexibility is very flexible. You have lots of options, lots of choices on what you have your children read. Okay, so here are some suggested readings for different levels. This first little reader set 
this there are lots of sets like this let me start there it is guided reading at level a which is kind of the very basic of the basics and it has all of these little books there's about 25 books in there and each book has three or four words on each page and each word is one to three letters in this first set it's super useful for your very beginning readers once they're beginning to recognize letter letters sounds and basic words when you get a little more advanced this was my little sister's favorite book amelia bedelia now let me warn you amelia bedelia has bigger words in it so you're going to have to work very hard with your child it is a little more advanced but once you're out of the first little readers this is a great transition it's also goofy and funny and entertaining to children and marley marley is a level two it's kind of in between the first readers and amelia bedelia but it's a lot of fun and goofy fun stuff these are the kinds of books when you're looking for books, you want to watch for those reading levels. If they have a reading level on them, then they're probably good for first and second grade. It's not till third grade that we let go of those reading levels. All right. I promised you 10 recommended shows. Before I get into them, let me share the authority on which I state these. These are not shows with hardcore research. These are a little more anecdotal authority. Um, and I'll explain each show as I go. But most of these shows I actually got suggested by a 10 year old who remembers what he used to love to watch and what he's okay with his four year old brothers and sister watch. An eight year old who still watches a lot of these. And well, one of the four year olds. And I asked them what their favorite shows were. And I pulled from those shows the ones that, according to both me and their mother, have the most educational benefit. Basically, I went to my nieces and nephews and asked them for their favorite shows and then talked to their mom about the ones that have had the best educational impact. So let's get started on 10 suggested television shows for when you need your child to be occupied so you can feed them and do their laundry. First one, Dora the Explorer. Now this one, if you've never showed it to your kids, I highly recommend taking the road of encouraging your child to take part in it. Dora is a lot of fun. It's great about following steps and following directions and listening. It's really important to teach your child to listen. If you don't teach them to listen, they won't listen. So it is really beneficial. And then each episode has little things that she does that are also educational, puzzles she solves and things like that. Her cousin Diego, it's a little more complicated than Dora and tends to really draw the boys in as well because it's a little more adventurous, but along the same lines. Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. I highly recommend Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, not only because my niece and nephews love it, but because when I was a child, I loved it. And so it's something that has aged well. And he does mostly behavior education and character education, but that is very important for children as well. After Mr. Rogers passed away, they continued on his legacy with Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, and Daniel Tiger comes from his uh, made up world, which was always the kid's favorite part of Mr. Rogers. It works really well for character building and there's a little more educational influence in there as well. Sesame Street, we all know Sesame Street. It's been around for a very long time. It's a great way to introduce your kids to the alphabet. It's a great way to introduce your kids to uh, character interactions and and counting and all kinds of fun stuff. Sid the science kid. Okay so um, Sid the science kid is about a little boy who's maybe six years old. He's going to what appears to be kindergarten or first grade and he loves science. He loves to ask questions. He loves to explore and he loves to find the answers. 
It is really beneficial for kids. It sets up the foundation of what is the scientific method. So if science is important to you, sit the science kid is very useful. Magic school bus. Now, I'm gonna get on my high horse for a minute. I love the magic school bus. I watch it with my nieces and nephews whenever I have the opportunity, but only the original one. Miss Frizzle is the best and it is the best show if it's the original. I'm not a huge fan of the remake. It's not as engaging. It is educational, but it doesn't seem to hold the kids' attention as well. Little Einsteins. Okay, so this is me and my personal hobby coming out. My nieces and nephews love Little Einsteins. I can put it on and they'll watch it for almost as long as I'll let them. Um, but the other thing about Little Einsteins is it introduces them to the idea of music. So if you want your children to be well-rounded, Little Einsteins gives them basic concepts of real music, such as note reading and what the different notes do and melodies and famous musicians and stuff like that, as well as logical thinking and mathematical thinking because it's about solving puzzles and making the pieces fit where they belong. <coughs> Ooh, pardon. Mm -mm. <coughs> pardon me. Oh my goodness. On that same note, music is super good for your child's brain. But I'm not talking about pop music, I'm not talking about rock and roll, I'm not talking about country or even contemporary Christian. I'm talking about classical music, Mozart and Brahms and Beethoven. Those are what's good for your children. It's good for their brain development. But who can get their child to sit still and listen to Mozart? Let's be honest here. So if you want to encourage listening to this music, let me share with you what my mother did to get us to listen to it. And that is this show, Merry Melodies. The original Merry Melodies are goofy cartoons set to great pieces of music. There's no dialogue. It's just animation and music. And those are super good for your children because the cartoon will keep them engaged so they actually he hear the music and it affects their brain. It affects their ability to listen, their ability to self-control and self-regulate. Research has proven time and time again, classical music is good for your children. Merry Melodies is a fun, engaging way to get them to listen to classical music. And finally, Leapfrog. Leapfrog is very popular with my nieces and nephews. They love to watch it. It goes into puzzles. There's letters and numbers and shapes and colors and adding and subtracting and making words and the kids love it. I definitely recommend it if you happen to have Leapfrog toys or especially a Scout. They love it. Those are my 10 recommended shows for your children for those times when you need them to be occupied. And they are all educational. So that is it for my video today. I hope you guys have a great day and I will see you next week.